Dr. Muhammad. Next up, uh, we have our very own uh, Dr. Dessa Tells. He, Jordan and I actually played in sports against each other as kids. Jordan will not admit to beating me, but uh, he definitely embarrassed me in many events. But uh, that was... <laughs> uh, Jordan, a fun fact about Jordan is he's actually been struck by lightning. Um, so maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that in a minute. And I voted Jordan most likely to be on a new reality TV show, Pleasantly Lost in Alaska. <laughs> Oh, sorry, here, I gotta just get this pulled up. Okay, um, good morning. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about traumatic open globe injuries at the Marana Eye Center um, and reviewing some of our experience that we've had as uh, surgeons operating on these cases over the last year. So in terms of objectives, I really want to kind of review the demographics and characteristics of open globe injuries at the Moran Eye Center over the last year. And I also want to spend some time describing the literature that we use to base our timing repair guidelines. Um, and at the end, review some lessons and uh, possible points of improvement or, or thoughts for the future going forward. So for the methodology, you can actually, there's this really cool tool in Epic. You can actually build case reports in Epic. Um, so I actually built uh, my own search tool. This was kind of my first experience with this. Um, and in terms of defining the parameters, I only use cases performed within the last year. Um, that's from October 1st, 2023 to October 8th, 2024, when I ran the analysis. And that's partially because it's just a lot of information to go through, but I also kind of wanted to reflect that period over which we have been using um, our new OR case add-on time protocols, uh, where we want to get patients in the OR by 5 p.m. to hopefully respect our call team and get them out by 7 p.m. Um, we used locations only being the Moran and the main OR. We did not look into pediatric open globe cases just because uh, that's a whole separate issue dealing with Icentra. Um, and the service was set to ophthalmology because um, it's weird. There are some extraneous like dermatology cases and stuff that may get in there. Um, and then the relevant procedural CPT code codes um, included 65275 for repair of corneal lacerations and uh, 65280 to capture um, both corneal and scleral lacerations, and then uh, 65286 to capture just full thickness eye wounds in general. Um, those were fairly broad and intentionally sensitive. Um, so a fair number of results actually had to be manually discarded. And then I also had to contain in the procedure description contains open glow. Just uh, again, there's just a lot of extraneous cases and that helped uh, get that number down without having to get rid of any relevant cases. So essentially all the charts corresponding to the generated MRNs were manually reviewed. And the data was structured into an Excel format. I know you can't see this. I just want you to see that I made an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> um, and um, we only included traumatic open globes. You know, some of the cases that we have are um, infectious perforations or immunologic corneal perforations, things like that. Those are not as amenable to um, timing analyses. Um, and so those those were left out of the analysis. Um, and ultimately, I collected data data on age, gender, self-reported race, home zip code, tried to get a sense of when the patients were arriving, when they were going to the OR, when the injuries occurred, um, and then also descriptions of the injuries and some of their follow-up uh, data, including their visual outcomes um, and um, kind of where they stand now with any secondary surgeries. So all this is really, to describe you know, who are our open globe patients and where are they coming from. So within the search period from October 1st to October 8th, over the course of one year, we had 35 traumatic open globe injuries that were operated on here by Moran Eye Center surgeon or at the main university OR. 
Six percent of them were female. Twenty-nine were male. Going well for the guys. The average age of our patients is fifty-one years old. Sixty-five percent of them are white. And then I also wanted to look at you know where are these patients coming from. So sixty-four percent of our patients come from within the state of Utah. I actually went through all their charts and got their zip codes, which can be a little bit tricky because some of these people are traveling from, say, California and they get in a car accident in Idaho. So there were limited cases where you have to use the outside hospital to which they first presented as a proxy zip code. And then all of those zip codes were essentially plugged into Google Maps and routed to the Moran Eye Center. And that was done under uh, no traffic, no inclement weather conditions. And what we see with that analysis, the average drag time for our open globe injuries is two hours and 20 minutes. Now there's a huge variation in this, and some of them are coming you know, from way northern Montana, so that right shifts the data a little bit. So when you look at the median time, it's only about an hour, um, which I thought was actually really interesting because I think we get this sense on call that people are coming from so, so far away, but most of them really are within an hour of our institution. Operations by day of the week is actually fairly concordant with what we would expect. There's more operations performed on Sunday. This reflect, reflects the general rowdiness of Saturdays and Saturday nights, uh, but we do have consistent volume throughout the week as well. If we look at the proportion of cases performed on site, a little over half of the cases we perform here at the Moran OR and just less than half go to the main university OR. <laughs> The visual acuity data is also somewhat what you would expect. Um, if you look at the difference between the presenting visual acuity seen in blue and the final visual acuity seen in red, uh, we do see that the proportion of patients with very poor vision, say 2,800 or worse, decreases after repair, um, and the patients with what we call in the open globe world good vision or 2,200 or better does increase. And then you can see that unfortunately, some of these patients are lost to follow up. When we think about the injury types that we see here in Utah, we definitely have less violent trauma, less firearm-related trauma than maybe some other urban centers do. Um, but our injury types are actually fairly concordant with what is published in the literature. About 60% of our injuries are blunt trauma with globe rupture. And then 40% are laceration injuries, either perforating or penetrating. And 10 cases, so about 30%, are involving retained intraocular foreign bodies, eight of them metal, one wood, and one glass. The time to operating room analyses are inherently challenging because you're relying on only the data that's that's in the chart, and sometimes that can be sparse. But I essentially wanted to break this into two components, and, and one of those components is time from the injury to the time they go to the operating room, um, and that's a little bit more difficult to estimate. Most of the records I reviewed actually in the HPI by the resident, they do say what time the injury occurred and what date. But some of them just say generally like in the morning on a certain date or in the afternoon. So some sort of proxy times did have to be used for that analysis. But in terms of the time from arrival to operating room, which is what I think we care about more, um, we essentially just use either the first, the time of the first ER triage note, or if they somehow came directly to us, like through our triage center, um, then we just use the time of the initial ophthalmology note. And what we see performing that analysis is we actually do a really good job getting these patients to the OR. So the median time from getting to our facility to going to the OR is 11 hours. You know, and that's much less than our standardly cited 24 hour range. Um, and we only had one instance where the patient went out to 24 hours after they arrived here. If you look at time from injury to the operating room, a lot of those factors are really outside of our control, um, but that median is much higher, um, 22 and a half hours, although there are some way outliers that kind of pull some of that data to the right as well. So I wanted to do a little bit of a subgroup analysis and look at our uh, prolonged injury to repair time cases and just see if there's any data we could ascertain that was you know, really driving this. 
-hmm. we don't have enough cases to be statistically powered, but there are some general trends that, that can be uh, concluded. And there's 15 total cases of injury delay. About a third of those cases have some legal implication. So either there was an assault um, or there was a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and you wonder to what extent that may drive delays in care. Um, a third are work-related. You know, again, this is fairly speculative, but you start to think about things like, you know, employer status, um, worry about repercussions with employment, worrying about immigration status, do those things come into play? The biggest factor that, you know, seems to be identified here is presenting to an outside hospital before getting to us notably decreases care. They spend hours and hours and hours at these outside ERs, and then the transfer process is inherently long. So in conclusion, from our analysis, essentially our average open globe patient is a 51-year-old white guy from Utah. Um, and our injury patterns and visual outcomes actually track really well with nationally published averages. And we do a really good job with antibiotic prophylaxis with our intravenous and sometimes intravitreal protocols. Um, essentially, none of our patients develop endophthalmitis. That's that third point's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. And, and so no one, some people came to us with endophthalmitis, like we had a wood foreign body from Montana who had been in the backcountry already for 24 hours and came in with endophthalmitis, but no one secondarily developed endophthalmitis after the time of repair, which, which is very impressive. And I'll talk about some of the national averages for that in a moment. Um, and then, as I said, our patients are a little more local than it feels like. And we do a really good job actually of getting people to the OR promptly. So I have to be honest, I, I think when I was looking at the timing outcomes, um, they didn't I was a little surprised because they didn't necessarily match how I felt on call. I felt like there were certain instances when I was on call and I was thinking to myself, geez, you know, would this patient have been better served by getting to the operating room more expediently? These are the cases where, you know, it's 3 p.m. and you're still working on the intake and trying to get scans and there's no way you're gonna get that patient to the OR by 5 p.m. This is talking about the Moran specifically on a weekday to get that goal prepared same day. Um, and I'm gonna, so I kind of wanted to explore the literature a little bit about, you know, where these 24 hour guidelines come from exactly. Um, and I kind of want to give a case that kind of demonstrates some of the challenges with defining why we get patients to the OR quickly. Um, and so this is a 77 year old male from Idaho who presented with a uh, right corneal graft. Did this after a blood trauma injury to the eye fell onto his dresser when he was getting up in the morning. Um, he had a previous uh, open globe injury in that eye. It was complicated by a retinal detachment. He had a scleral buckle and ACIOL in place, and he had a prior corneal scar that necessitated subsequent uh, PK. And his baseline vision was actually pretty good, all things considered. It was 2060 prior to this injury. When I saw him, he had hand motion vision. He had 180 degree graft dehiscence. His ACIOL was visible within a flat AC. And the, the posterior view was, was very warped and distorted because the cornea was so distorted. It was essentially inverted from the hypotony. Um, but you could tell that the, the media was actually very clear, that there wasn't any heme or anything like that, um, and the red reflex was actually decent. Um, essentially, what ended up happening with this case is that he was found to have a minor aortic root dilation. It was only like 0.4 centimeters above the threshold, but that was two years ago, and so you didn't feel comfortable with the case. Ultimately, the case got delayed, was not able to go at the, um, you know, by that 5 p.m., start time threshold and so he ended up going the following day right at about that 24 hour mark and at that time once i saw him in the or with uh dr gill such a dense anterior chamber a heme there's no identifiable retrocorneal structures um he's had been in significant pain um and he was actually like fairly distressed by all of this um and his course went on to, you know, he's just had these kind of chronic choroidal hemorrhages. The heme has been difficult to clear. He's kind of ultimately gone for a secondary vitrectomy. Um, 
And I essentially have no way of saying, you know, would this guy have done better if we got to the OR immediately? And maybe he wouldn't have. And maybe really likely he wouldn't have. But it kind of got me thinking, you know, are there are there other outcomes other than just like endophthalmitis and visual acuity that constitute morbidity and constitute a reason to go earlier? And two, you know, with these injuries where you have a clear media and you have some visual potential, what do we do? Do we have any guidelines to go off of in terms of that 24 hour rule? We always just cite 24 hours. So I really want to know where 24 hours came from. Um, and the 24 hour rule, it really comes from two major things. It comes from endophthalmitis rates and it comes from visual acuity data. And the best uh, study we essentially have on this is um, the a meta analysis was actually done this year in August of 2024. And they clearly show that endophthalmitis rates are lower if you repair the globe within 24 hours. Again, that is kind of limited because time is not treated as a continuous variable. It's just an arbitrary cutoff that people have sort of used in the literature for a long time. So then all the subsequent studies get based on that 24 hour time point. Um, and then if you look at visual acuity data, you don't see any difference in visual outcomes if you do the repair early versus late. That's in the aggregate sense, that's a population level. Uh, but again, I, I think some of that is driven by the fact that so many people's vision is just so devastatingly poor at presentation with no real chance for improvement. So how do you get a statistical effect from that? It's, it's hard to say. This is the same data just reiterated in a, in a forest plot and clearly see that endophthalmitis rates are lower, whereas the visual acuity data on the bottom is a little bit more equivocal. Um, and of note, a lot of the studies we have to drive all this stuff, they're mostly from outside of the United States. This is kind of the best survey we have, and only one study is from the United States. Most of the studies are from China, the UK, and elsewhere. Maybe the ocular surface bacterial profile is totally different. Maybe there are differences in protocol of repair. It's, it's kind of hard to know. Um, the other kind of limitation of this study is that almost all of the open globe injury data we have, or at least in the meta-analytical sense, it comes from uh, cases with intraocular foreign bodies. So like something like 8,000 of the 11,000 eyes reviews in this case, in this meta-analysis had an intraocular foreign body, which is sort of a different beast. Um, and so I wanted to review endophthalmitis a little bit and try to gain a little bit more nuanced understanding that may drive changes to our practice patterns. So if you look at the overall rate of all comers developing endophthalmitis after an open globe injury, it's about 7%. That's from our uh, essentially national eye trauma registry data. That data has essentially dried up because we don't have funding for it anymore. And so that stopped in 2013. Antibiotic protocols, surgical protocols have improved. So looking at more uh, recent data from U.S. centers, this is Harvard's data from their ocular trauma survey, they get a rate that's closer to about 0.9% for endophthalmitis, um, and that can be geographic as well. Places that have a higher incidence of foreign bodies trauma probably have higher rates of endophthalmitis, and essentially what they found was that it really was their intraocular foreign bodies that seemed to be driving most of their very rare cases of endophthalmitis. So it kind of becomes this question of like, what do you do with an intraocular foreign body? Because when we're thinking about, do we need to go sooner? Do we need to go later? That would be one of the main drivers to say, oh, I think we need to go sooner, at least in our minds. So I wanted to review the literature on the intraocular foreign bodies a little bit, specifically retained intraocular foreign bodies. 18 to 40% of open globe injuries haven't retained intraocular foreign bodies. Our data is consistent. We're at about 30%. Most of them end up in the posterior segment. A minority end up elsewhere. Again, mostly young guys. Um, and to my knowledge, there's no recent studies that show much of a benefit of early intraocular foreign body removal. There are older studies that were really done in the 90s that say the rates of endophthalmitis and the rates of 
EVR for literature retinopathy go down if these repairs are performed within the first 24 hours. We have a lot of really interesting data out of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Huge series, 890 patients, 118 eyes that had IOFB removal. And because of the limitations of being in a combat zone, the mean delay is 31 days to get these intraocular foreign bodies removed. And patients actually do really well. There's not really any apparent effect on time to removal on the final visual acuity and alpha minus development or PVR development, assuming that the proper intravenous antibiotics or intravitreal antibiotics were delivered to the patients in a timely fashion. I think we have to take the Iraq and Afghanistan data with a little bit of salt. These are combat injuries. These are really, really hot foreign bodies. They're tending to come from, you know, projectile trauma. Yeah. But just, just I'm aware of some work in which they've taken those right out. I mean, they are hot. They're very, very hot. And, and uh, I tried to sterile, you know, and to culture them. And so this is different. These things are sterile. Yeah, and I think so. I think these are predominantly sterile. Um, and, and also they're, they're probably skewed towards being steel and lead just based on um, like the profile of the combatants that we were dealing with there. Um, whereas like we're probably dealing with more like low velocity, dirty or possibly more organic material here. So again, it's hard to say for sure. And, and you know, we also may deal with more things like copper and iron from more work-related injuries where you have a chalcosis risk or a siderosis risk where you'd want to go sooner. All this is to say is that we don't really, again, have great guidance on what to do. But this is a case um, that came in when I was working with Dr. Mojibar, um, actually as an undergrad. And due to the preponderance of metallic foreign bodies in the literature, you know, it drives all the literature, but I think we all in our guts see something like this. We have organic material in the eye. And you're saying this needs to come out probably like right now. And we don't, I don't think we're going to get a good data driven answer to when we do this. But I think intuitively from a human perspective, I think we all feel that if this was us or a loved one, we want to get this out right away. And so yeah, you can't randomize this. They were going to do an hour and wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, you know, we also don't have great data for how we manage other nuanced cases. Like, what if you have a patient with a fairly high ocular trauma score? So that's a good ocular trauma score with, a, you know, potentially good outcome and a somewhat unstable wound. Do you still take them at 24 hours? I think, I think mostly we would all feel that we'd want to take them as soon as, as possible. I think what's encouraging from at least our year of data is that we know that these cases where it's going to be a nuance like this are going to be very rare, almost never happen. And so we want to really be respectful of our OR team and their time. And I think when we're trying to design a policy, something like potentially extending till 11 p.m. to do these globes on weekdays, you know, we can be assured that this is going to happen very, very frequently. And we need to be aware that, you know, that is not a case where we want to utilize those services to repair an open globe that say has a retina on the cheek or something like that, where it's very poor outcomes. Because in that case, we know that the endophthalmitis data is favorable. We know the visual acuity data is, is equivocal, at least after 24 hours. Um, so for future directions, I think it'd be nice to pull all the data in Epic. If there's any uh, really motivated medical students that want to help me, that'd be great because it's really time consuming. Um, and then maybe kind of create some more institutional guidelines for specific parameters of like what are cases that would actually warrant triggering an on-call team to come in, you know, on a weeknight till say 11 p.m. And that's essentially all I have. So thank you very much.